Hey everyone, it's Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today, I'm going to be talking about the distortion and the disruption of narratives. So this is a piece that I published on my substack, kyla.substack.com. And I'm just going to be talking about everything from everything all the way down to everything. It was a really wide ranging piece. And I tried to incorporate as much as I could into this piece because there's so much going on and it's really difficult to, for me to decide on what topics to write about. So I'm talking about narrative flippage. I'm talking about narrative distortion. I'm talking about narrative disruption. I'm not going to be talking about Elon Musk today taking about a 10% stake in Twitter, nor am I going to be talking about Elon Musk joining the board of directors, but just as an FYI, both of those things happened. I'm going to be focusing more on macroeconomics and broader world problems. So getting right into it, this is my outline. So talking about safe havens, so switching from the yen, which is historically a safe haven, to meme stonks and then reserve currencies. So the dollar to a lot of other currencies and then capital as a signal. So at the Axie hack to Web3 VC and then indicators. So the yield curve to this concept of market brain and then narrative disruption. So leaders saying things like Larry Fink and Jamie Dimon, and then this concept of world order. So narratives beyond the age of information is the age of choices. This is a quote from Charles Eames, who is just a brilliant designer, has a lot of brilliant quotes. And I think it's really important to discuss who we are, our narratives, and how we interpret narratives. So our lives are mostly a result of the content that we interact with. We are sort of an average of the five people that we spend the most time with, and the things that we read and watch and the people that we talk to end up shaping our world. And that is compounded by algorithms, right? That also determine how we see the world. We end up tying ourselves into our online worlds because that's where we exist for most of the day. Like sure, you might have an in-person job or a running group that you're a part of, but most of us find ourselves within the confines of an online ecosystem. So what does that mean for how we develop a sense of self? The self, this is a quote from a really good research paper that I'm going to talk about, but it incorporates this idea of an algorithmic identity. So an algorithmic identity is an identity formation that works through mathematical algorithms to infer categories of identity on otherwise anonymous beings. So we spend a lot of time with ourselves, a lot of time with ourselves, especially in the online age. We have this connection through internet connection. Lieberman and Schroeder have a really good paper on this called The Two Social Lives, incorporating both the online and the offline and bring up a couple of important questions. Number one, how do our online interactions lead to misunderstanding and dehumanization? How does our globalized communication change universal norms? How do online interactions encourage the commodification or objectification of interaction partners? And how can online interaction resemble in-person interaction? All of these questions are super important, right? How do we build a concept of self? Why is the mask of the internet so powerful for trolls? Why why is there so much anger online and what are both the consequences and rewards of building both an offline and an offline self? And what do we become when the algorithm rewards behavior that is ultimately asking us to take all that we are and, and break it into these pieces of self-branding? Like I'm sure all of us have seen those people who will do tweet threads on how you can be the most productive person ever. You just have to give up your soul. No worries, my dude. A really grossly simplified way, who are we if not defined by our algorithmic interests? And what happens if we think consulting firms are the answer to comedy? So this was something that um, the Harvard Business Review published from Jerry Seinfeld, who they, they were like, yeah, you know, it was a struggle to produce comedy. It's hard. And the interviewer was like, well, did you ever talk to McKinsey? And they were like, who's that? And consulting firm, right? And so there's another quote from Charles Eames that's important on this. Recent years have shown a growing preoccupation with the circumstances surrounding the creative act and a search for the ingredients that promote creativity. This preoccupation in itself suggests that we are in a special kind of trouble. And indeed we are. Basically, Charles is like, the moment that we decide that we have to have a consulting firm to sort of formulaically formulaically decide what creativity is, we're in a world of hurt. And I think all of this boils down into a creativity crisis, an identity crisis, the divergence from the digital and the physical reality. And that's why we're seeing anger and intense dehumanization online and so much more. Like I experience, I think, a fragment of what other people experience, but there's, there's people who comment just absurd things. And it's because you're hidden behind this veil of the internet. But I think it's also because we don't really know who we are in this like algorithmic sense. And so our brains are also kind of breaking. When we have the part 
are the reality of the digital and the non-digital world, there's one that we can scroll away from and then one that we are inherently stuck in. And that creates a lot of trouble. For example, TikTok, this is from Michael Manos, the clinical director of the Center for Attention and Learning at the Cleveland Children's Clinic. He said, if kids' brains become accustomed to constant changes, the brain finds it difficult to adapt to a non-digital activity where things don't move quite as fast. Bandari and Bimo have a really wonderful research paper on how TikTok shapes us, stating TikTok users occupy the precarious position of duly engaging with an external and internal entity. They engage with versions of themselves as mediated through the algorithm. And then the question, then the question becomes like, what is the truest version of ourselves? And you know, you're probably like listening to me right now and you're like, what Kyla are you saying? And I think that this is important. This is something that I've tried to hit on a couple of times, but I don't think I've ever made the point explicitly is that uh, humans are economics, right? Like economics is essentially monetized philosophy. And so it's really important to understand how we exist in the economy, but then also really important to understand how human, humans interact. Our algorithmic selves are how we consume content and thus how we interpret the world around us, which is important in context of understanding the narrative of the broader economic system and the role that we play in it. So I think that the more that we can understand humans, the more that we can understand the world around us to a certain extent, because everything are these big narratives. And it's how we see the world through our own algorithmic lens that often impacts how, how we see these things. Do you, <laughs> I'm doing big hand motions for those listening via audio only. Uh, but so let's get into this idea of a narrative flip. So just keep all that in mind as I'm talking, like how you see the world impacts how you interpret information and that impacts how decisions are made. But let's talk about narrative flipping. So safe havens, the yen uh, historically is a safe haven commodity, but not really anymore. As shown in this graph, the yen is not an all purpose risk off hedge. It used to be the safest place to go. The yen was the safe haven. It appreciated when people were like, what the heck is going on? When people are risk of and trying to find stability. So right now, it should be the yen's time to shine, right? Like we have great uncertainty with the, the war in Ukraine, but the yen isn't really responding in the way that it usually would. This is mostly because of policy divergence and very weak economic data from Japan. So Japan has ultra loose monetary policy. The Bank of Japan is like, whoa, we're going to be like leaning back, chilling. We're going to keep rates at zero. When the rest of the world is in an inflationary crisis, you had Brainerd come out today and be like, things are crazy with inflation. So you just have a lot of inflation around the world, but not in Japan. <laughs> and so this divergence in monetary policy is concerning. So they're maintaining low rates through yield curve control to try and get that economy off the ground, which is like, oh my gosh, how many bonds are they going to end up buying? Because it's an unlimited bond buying program. And that is essentially the government totally interfering, intervening with any sort of price signal action at all. And so that divergence makes market participants go like, whoa, okay, yikes, I'm going to like stay away from Japan right now because that's pretty freaking wild, dude. And it's a huge dichotomy. Easy monetary policy in Japan versus hawkishness from the rest of the world, which is not really great. So everyone was like, maybe the yen is not the best place anymore. The Bank of Japan governor isn't super worried about a weak yen, but a weak yen makes inputs more expensive down the line, especially as we see upticks in commodity prices. And it's also like, how long can a central bank buy unlimited bonds for? Uh, so yikes, right? So memes as a safe haven commodity. Edwin Dorsey said that AMC is trying to become the Berkshire Hathaway for meme stocks. And I thought that was super insightful because AMC is buying the gold miner, GameStop is doing a stock split and like it works, right? And it will continue to work until it doesn't, of course, because retail is like, yeah, I believe in the stock. I, I don't believe in the company. Like, I don't believe in the company, but I believe in the stock. And that's a completely different narrative, right? Like you, you can do everything that you want. Like, let's say you love Costco as a company. Maybe you don't want them as stock. You're still going to like be like, yeah, Costco is a good company, but AMC, GameStop, they're, they're fundamentally not good companies. And that is what is so wild about these memes as safe haven commodities is the stocks themselves are inciting people to go and buy them. And it doesn't make sense. And that's why it makes sense. Like you really can't explain why a stock would increase in price after it announces a stock split. Like that's just not supposed to like, when you're, when you take finance in college, like I did. <laughs> That's just something that they teach you. It's like, oh, this is not going to be a big deal because uh, stock splits fundamentally don't impact stock prices. But you see the market not treating it like that. So it's just interesting with all that stuff. And so getting a little bit more into currencies. So the dollar, the dollar is facing its downfall. Everybody's saying this is from a paper from the IMF. The shift out of dollars, in fact, is not overwhelming a shift into China's currency. The shift out of dollars is more substantially shift into the currencies of smaller economies that historically had less of scale and liquidity needed to constitute an attractive form of international reserves. So everyone likes to say that the dollar's brain is going to end soon. And the IMF addressed that in this paper called the stealth erosion of dollars 
dominance. And the main takeaway was basically like, yeah, the dollar is declining as a share of international reserves, but there isn't another currency stepping up. It's not like China's currency is stepping up. It's not like Russia, the ruble is stepping up. It's mostly a move into smaller currencies. And that makes sense, right? And that ties into the broader theme of domestic protectionism and onshoring and deglobalization that we've talked about before, where everyone is going to try and protect their own space. As the IMF wrote, the most notable trend in recent decades has been the rise of non-traditional reserve currencies, the currencies of countries without the economic scale and volume of cross-border transactions that distinguish traditional reserve currency issuers. If dollar dominance comes to an end, a scenario not a prediction, then the greenback could be felled not by the dollar's main rivals, but by a group of broad alternative currencies. So it's sort of like the dollar will remain the dollar until money fragments into many other currencies. But there isn't like one main currency that's going to step up and, and take its place. But there are some potential rumblings. I will acknowledge that. There are a lot of rumblings. The world order is shifting a little bit. As Adam Tooze wrote, uh, mainly in response to Zoltan's note on Merling's money framework, but it works well in this context as well. If Russia, China is to form anything like an equivalent to the global dollar system, they have a long way to go. There is huge asymmetry in the world right now between the financial system that remains spectacularly euro dollar centered and the new multipolarity of power trade and economic activity. The world is multipolar and so is global trade. Western policy must adjust to that. And so then, you know, will Bitcoin become the new reserve currency? And this gets into narrative distortion. So things are confusing. One could argue that it's a little bit crazy out there. And I think this gets into capital as a signal. And I have a lot of opinions on this. So I'm going to try and remain relatively unopinionated. But just know if I sound passionate, it's because I really think this is an interesting topic. But the Axie hack in Web3BC. So Ronin, which is an Ethereum sidechain, hosts a play to earn game called Axie Infinity, which is very popular for people to make money from, especially in lower income countries like the Philippines, Thailand, etc. And it's you have managers of these people. It's like a really absurd thing, but the, the value of the game has declined significantly and it got hacked. <laughs> so there are nine validator nodes and the hacker got a hold of five and they were able to essentially rock and roll because they had these five validator nodes. And it was one of the biggest hacks in the crypto universe. No one noticed for like six days and they tried, the hackers tried to move money into FTX. And um, I think this broadly underscores a few key things. Number one, cybersecurity is going to be a huge theme over the next few years. Number two, crypto is pretty scam and elastic. It doesn't matter how many rug pulls or hacks there are. You can still raise $200 million again, as Wormhole has proved, which is good. Like that Wormhole can rebuild after they got hacked. But there's so many scams that are getting money, not calling Wormhole or Axie a scam. But broadly speaking, there's so many scams that are getting money. And all of this is calibration. So it makes sense. But it's also like, oh no, Web3 ABC, stop investing in everything that has Web3 in its name. I promise <laughs> it might not be the thing that you think it is. And it's just the third thing is this building to build concept. And I think that this is a problem across the board. It's really top of funnel problem. There's so many people that want to become venture capitalists. And there's so many people that have a fund or trying to join a fund and they're all allocating money into the same spaces. And it's kind of like, what if you like didn't do that. It's really this whole like capital allocation issue is something that I personally have to spend a little bit more time reflecting on. But I think it's broadly really interesting because it brings up this question on if you have a mediocre idea for a thing, you're going to get money to a certain extent. <laughs> maybe. And the mediocre things are often puzzle pieces that don't really fit into anywhere because nobody wanted the puzzle in the first place. As Yoni highlights in his tweet, people are building the things, so here video games platforms, a video game platform, without the video games that would need that platform to succeed. So it's a platform with no games, a marketplace with no users, a B2B SaaS company with no real use case, etc. And they're all taking money. And the way that I think about this is like a video game sync. So if you're playing a video game, there's like, there's usually a sync in the game to help control and inflation of the game. And I think that some of these VC investments are video game sinks. Yikes. As Honam said, easy money, which does have strings attached, is going to cause harm. If you don't know where the boundaries lies, is there really competence? Competence. Yield curves. I know I'm like bouncing around, but let's do it. So the yield curve is sort of fuzzied out by easy money too, as the Fed themselves write. It's not valid to interpret inverted term spreads as an independent measure of impending recession. They largely reflect the expectations of market participants, which I think are, you know, one could argue that's pretty important. And expectations manifest a threat of reality too. So I'm taking a little bit of liberty with their paper, but they argue that we should focus on the near term forward spread specifically. But the authors explain that we tend to focus on nominal interest rates when we really should be looking at real rates, which is totally 
absolutely true, which are inflation adjusted. So when 10 year yield is greater than two year yield, that means that growth is expected to accelerate. So 10 years is looking better than two years. And when the two year is less than the 10 year, that means that things are just not looking that hot. So basically the yield curve is economic vibes. It measures economic vibes. When it inverts, the vibes are off. <laughs> and when it's upward sloping, the vibes are good. But sometimes the vibes are confusing. The yield curve inverting does not mean that a recession will follow. In the most simplified version, it just means that things are not looking hot. And so stocks just sort of do whatever after the yield curve inverts. Like things just kind of keep on going. As Joey writes in his really good piece on the yield curve, still the yield curve isn't useless. Knowing that investors likely expect nominal interest rates to decrease sometime in the future is important to assessing the economic outlook. However, it is always necessary to put bond market movements in context with other economic data points. And this is important. So the yield curve matters because it matters in context and it matters as a signal. We must understand why things go up because that will tell us why things go down. Narrative disruption. So leaders are saying things. Larry Fink wrote a very strongly worded letter about the future of globalization, which basically boiled down to it's the beginning of the end. And Jamie Dimon also discussed how chaos will reign if America doesn't get their act together. And to Larry Fink, so this is a quote from his piece, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has put an end to globalization we have experienced over the last three decades. We had already seen connectivity between nations, companies, and even people strained by two years of the pandemic. It has left many communities and people feeling isolated and looking inward. I believe that this has exacerbated the polarization and extremist behavior we've seen across society. I agree with Larry. Uh, and remember, one black rock is in everything. So when Larry says like things are not good, we should probably listen to him. And as Adam Tews and the Unhedged team wrote in response to Fink, this is mostly a function of geopolitics. So countries are trying to figure stuff out with concepts of sanctions, and they're going to be like, well, we don't want to have that much exposure to the United States because that's crazy. And they're going to do what they can to protect themselves against that. And then energy. So as Russia has repeatedly proven, if you provide somebody with natural gas, they're going to be a certain type of indebted to you. If you demand that they pay you in rubles, they're going to strongly consider it, even if it ends up making sanctions pretty much inert. And energy is just a huge part of the globalization slash deglobalization narrative. Energy is the common denominator of everything. So domestically, oil makes politics successful or not. So politicians are incentivized to make people feel somewhat okay about prices at the pump so they don't get voted out of office. So they say, hey, here's some gas money. Don't spend it all in one place. And there's a lot of skew on price because all of a sudden people get an influx of cash. So gas demand goes up, supply is the same. So prices now actually increase, or you can release oil from the strategic petroleum reserve, which also sort of kind of works sometimes if you believe in it. And uh, then there's political instability that kind of results from all of this. So mostly if you don't have stable energy sources, you're likely not going to have a stable political system and governments are super aware of that, which is why we going back to the domestically oil makes politics successful or not, they're going to want to take care of that. So then you have demographic changes. So people are getting old. Developed nations have uh, exported a lot of their production to developing nations, but as those nations age, no more underpaid labor. Labor. And so everyone is like, wow, the world is changing. Things are different, but nobody is doing a whole lot about it as the Financial Times highlights. It's a weird form of cognitive dissonance to talk as though you recognize the headwinds and not price them in, hoping perhaps that some they will not after all materialize. Something similar holds for globalization more generally. There's a lot of talk about reshoring and rebuilding supply chains, but far less actions on substance. Apple actually increased its reliance on China last year. So things are not thinging the way that we thought they would always think, but they're still thinging the way that they've thung before. I think that makes sense. <laughs> and then will ESG save us? I think we all know how I feel about this, but one thing that I think is well known for is ESG, the ESGification of everything. How can this fossil fuel producer become green by buying carbon credits and the world will be saved? But the transition to ESG, which both Tews and Fink highlight in their pieces, is going to be long and it's going to require underlying commodities, raw materials like copper, lithium, and cobalt. And these are the materials, for example, needed to build a wind turbine, steel, copper, concrete, aluminum, and rare earth elements. And the UK plans to build 7,000 wind turbines, which is awesome. But also the cost of these inputs has increased substantially. And lithium is a huge component of electric vehicles. Copper is a huge component of everything. So it's not like we can just say, oh yeah, green energy is going to save us good everyone buy Tesla, awesome. There's going to be a transition and it relies on raw materials and underlying commodities. This is Elon Musk. I am increasingly convinced that corporate ESG is the devil incarnate. ESG gets in its gets in its own way. It's an annoying compliance check mark that ends up causing more harm than good because we simply don't have funds that matches the mandates. To play that broken record again, we can't have green energy policy without green energy investment. This is Ryan Peterson, the CEO of Fast, or the CEO of um, Flexport, <laughs> not Fast. All ships in the world have to go 30 percent slower starting Gen 1. I don't know if they have to go slower as much as like they're going to be 
really cracking down on carbon emissions, cutting the capacity of the ocean network, the circulatory system of the world economy by 30% will cause untold economic devastation. I don't know. This is Biden's budget too. So it's just kind of like, you know, you got $800 billion going towards the military, which makes sense. Like after uh, a war in Ukraine and after China doing whatever they're doing, there's going to be the need for more domestic protectionism. And that does come also in the form of an amped up military. But, you know, there's $4 billion for climate, 11 billion for international climate aid. So it's kind of like our priorities may be a little skewed. And then getting into Russia and Ukraine. So Russia is committing more than war crimes in Ukraine and the sanctions are effective, but they're not going to be enough for, to deter Russia from this horrific path. The ruble strengthening mostly because people can't get rid of them, capital controls. So it's going to be more sanctions likely to, that'll be put in place to try and stop Russia, but more has to be done. That's that's all I'm going to say about that. Some final thoughts. So this is a favorite quote from Eric Fromm. Love of others and love of ourselves are not alternatives. On the contrary, an attitude of love towards themselves will be found in all those who are capable of loving others. Love in principle is indivisible as far as the connection between objects and one's own self are concerned. I think that's important. I'm going to talk quickly just for like a minute about some projects that I'm working on. So I'm working on a longer piece around the economic system. So like, what is the economy? And really just diving deep in, into the mechanics of the economic machine. And then I'm also going to launch a daily sub stack where it's just an experiment. Um, I'll see how it feels. I'll see what the feedback is. If people are not vibing, I'm not going to do it. But I think it'd be helpful from just a note aggregation perspective. And then also just talking about like the wacky things that happen every day. And then I'm thinking also about doing a quick daily YouTube, but I already, already do a daily TikTok, so I'm not sure if what I'll do about that, but there will be a longer piece on the economic machine coming out soon. I also have some links on this sub stack if you want to go check those out, just like stuff I found interesting, but didn't have space or time to write about in terms of like not taking up an entire 20,000 pages to write one newsletter. But yeah, so if you want to go ahead and hit subscribe, that really does help a lot. And I appreciate you and I hope that you're doing good and I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.